the new definition is so exquisitely crafted and took so long that I do not want to do it any injustice whatsoever by misremembering it, so I'm going to actually read it to you as it's worded. Dry eye is a multifactorial disease of the ocular surface characterized by a loss of homeostasis of the tear film and accompanied by ocular symptoms in which tear film instability and hyperosmolarity, ocular surface inflammation and damage, and neurosensory abnormalities play etiological roles." End quote. So that is the definition as it stands now. Will it change in the future? Maybe. We're going to learn a lot more about this stuff in the next 10 years. But as it stands now, that is the current definition. And another point of the whole TFOS 2 effort was not only to update the definition, that's a big part of it, but certainly one of the other major uh, initiatives was to get the world speaking the same language. You know, the, one of the big problems and part of the frustration for a lot of people, patients and doctors alike, is that uh, you know, there has never been a true consensus as to what dry eye is, how to measure it, how to define it, how to study it, you know, clinical trials, et cetera, all the... So the TFOS2 created this definition in a way to homogenize the world and that we can all be on the same page when it comes to what this all means. And the word, every single word in that definition was scrutinized, it was debated, it was you know, thought about very carefully for two years, and so every word is important. And so I would encourage everyone to, to read that, not only once, but many, many times, and really think about what each word means. A disease, something as, as innocuously seeming as disease. You know, a lot of people haven't considered dry eye a disease. It's a dysfunction, it's a disorder, it's a syndrome. Uh, it's a dysfunctional tear syndrome. It's various monikers have gone, uh, and, but it is a disease. And, and the reason why it was called a disease in this definition is that it's understood, I'm gonna read this too because I don't wanna screw this one up, understood to be a disorder of structure or function or a condition of illness that results in specific signs or symptoms with pathologic and quality of life implications. That is a disease, it's not a dysfunction, it's not a syndrome. The ocular surface, does everybody know what the ocular surface entails? Not everybody does. Is the ocular surface just the tear film in the, over the cornea? No, the ocular surface is the eye and the adnexa, the cornea, the conjunctiva, the eyelids, the eyelashes, tear film, the main and accessory lacrimal glands, and of course, very importantly, the meibomian glands. All of those things factor into dry eye and the definition of dry eye, and that's why the ocular surface was included. Homeostasis, this is fundamental, and this was not in the original uh, the TFOS does one di uh, definition, I, if I recall, I don't think homeostasis was the word, but this is a word that we use and we're coming back to and I want people all over, certainly in the U.S., but all over the world to start using that term, to think of this as a disruption of homeostasis. What is homeostasis? I think most doctors know what it is, but I'll tell you that homeostasis, it describes a state of equilibrium in the body with respect to its various functions. The ocular surface to maintain homeostasis requires all those units, the lacrimal functional unit and all of its various parts, and the tight synergy amongst everything communicating with each other in harmony, as it were. And so many things can disrupt that homeostasis and can lead to this dry eye. But homeostasis as a fundamental concept, I think, is really important. Uh, the tear film. You know, the tear film, mo many people think of the tear film as just Com comforting the eye and keeping it feeling okay. But the tear film is also very critical in maintaining vision, quality of vision, not just visual acuity, but the quality of vision. And a lacking tear film or a disrupted tear film can affect vision in addition to not protect the ocular surface and lead to symptoms uh, of discomfort. And this, I think, is part of the definition that we said, it said, accompanied by ocular symptoms. This actually is very different from the original definition, and this was very purposeful. And it's very important, as I said, we want to homogenize the world and have everybody on the same page. What I didn't know, but I found from being part of the TFOS Dues 2 effort, was that dry eye symptoms are described very differently in different parts of the world. The symptom that I might describe as grittiness or foreign body sensation, somebody in Japan or China or South America may say something completely different. And there are so many variables that go into perception of discomfort and uh, cultural issues and language issues so that the term accompanied by ocular symptoms was very purposeful.
Discomfort and visual disturbance certainly remain fundamental to dry eye around the world, but again, people word that very differently, so we didn't want to narrow it to a certain, uh, a couple certain uh, symptoms that might not be applicable in other parts of the world. Uh, and so with this new word, it restricts, it, it avoids restrictions and it maximizes the relevance across the world and encompasses a broader range of possible symptoms that people from different places may uh, verbalize uh, or may feel. Uh, so I thought that, to me, that's brilliant and, and that's a beautiful thing and it really does help to homogenize everybody. And then of course the etiological roles of things like uh, tear instability and hyperosmolarity, ocular surface inflammation and damage, and the neurosensory ab abnormalities. Um, it doesn't mean that to have dry eye disease you have to have an abnormality, a measurable abnormality in all of those things. It means that all of those things are, are key in the pathogenesis of dry eye disease and certainly often play etiological roles but not in every single situation. And so it doesn't mean you have to measure each of those things, it just means that one should know that these are the core uh, mechanisms and, uh, and the neurosensory abnormalities were definitely not part of the original DUES definition, but are part of the TFOS DUES 2 definition. And I think that tells, says a lot about what we've learned in the last decade about the role of the corneal nerves and corneal sensation and, and pain syndromes and things like that. Everybody's on the same page. You know, it will not only help patients, it will help doctors identify uh, patients with dry eye disease, it will help patients get the right treatments, and very importantly, it will help to sort of homogenize clinical trial designs and clinical trial outcomes. We can compare apples to apples as opposed to apples to oranges to pears to grapes. You know, it's just been this every step. This is why, in some ways, why it took two years to really sort of peel through all of this stuff because every paper, not every paper, but many of the papers have different endpoints, different symptoms for inclusion and so on and so forth, and to try to make, you know, uh, overarching decisions and, and, uh, and uh, connections between all of these various papers is very difficult to do. So if we all start speaking the same language going forward, we'll be in a much better place and we'll have much more robust data that's comparable. Reclassification uh, is important, and it was uh, the issues with the, the sort of the reclassification. Uh, and it's not when we say reclassification, we're talking about sort of the approach to the person who walks into the office. One of the uh, historical issues around this dry eyes and ocular surface disease was that there was this sort of classic disconnect often between signs and symptoms. A patient comes in with a complaint, the doctor doesn't see anything that he can sort of blame the, the, the symptoms on, and the doctor is frustrated and says, there's nothing wrong with you, your eyes look fine. The patient says, well, no, I'm having this, this problem, I'm frustrated. The doctor says, or thinks, you're whining, like there's nothing wrong, you get out, you know, take an artificial tear and don't, don't come back with this complaint. The patient leaves frustrated. So that was a class and that's why some doctors never sort of embraced this and didn't like dealing with this on a day-to-day -day basis. On the flip side of that, there are patients who come in with signs, you know, of, of, of awful looking ocular surface, staining of the cornea, low tear lane, meibomian glands that don't express any oil at all. And patients, I'm fine, there's nothing wrong with me. I, well, what do you mean there's, I have a problem? I, and, and you want to treat what? Like, I, there's nothing wrong with me, I feel fine. And then that disconnect where the doctor wants to do this treatment and, and, and patient doesn't think it's necessary. And so frustration on both sides of that equation. And so the reclassification scheme was kind of a way to kind of, in, in an overarching view of that patient who walks in the door, how to sort of compartmentalize each of those patients. If a patient comes in, they're either symptomatic or asymptomatic. If they're symptomatic, they can have signs or no signs. If they're asymptomatic, they could have signs or no signs. What does it mean and how do you sort of get to either a dry eye diagnosis or something else that is explaining their symptoms? And that is where the reclassification scheme comes in. I would encourage everyone to either read the, of course everybody should read the TPOS dues to in its entirety, all 400 pages of it. But if you don't have that kind of time, uh, at least the executive summary. And all of these graphs and charts, that there's an algorithm that we will talk about, they're all in there in, in all of their glory, their color and their, and their complexity. But in some ways, a lot of, I say complexity because there's a lot to all of this, but the diagrams make it all quite easy to understand. It's not overly complex and anyone can look at these diagrams and understand what's going on here. And you can figure out who might be a neurotrophic 
person who might have dry eye disease, who might have MGD or aqueous deficient dry eye disease, who might uh, have a neuropathic condition, uh, and all of those subcategories are all part of this reclassification. Or who might have an other ocular surface disease or dysfunction that's not true dry eye disease. For, so if everybody can sort of get on board with this classification scheme, they're going to, they're, A, they're going to do better by their patients. The patients are going to be much happier. They're going to enjoy, I mean, let's face it, this is the majority of the patients who we see on a day-to-day -day basis. Sure, we might, we see a lot of cataracts and corneal diseases and retina and glaucoma and so on and so forth, but almost all of those patients will have some form of ocular surface dysfunction or dry eye disease. And we have to, everybody needs to get on board with dealing with this on a day-to-day -day basis. And if you have a little bit of knowledge, knowledge, knowledge is power, and this simplifies it so that you can very easily classify each of your patients who walks in the door as one of these, into one of these compartments, or multiple compartments, because a lot of these patients are multifactorial. The fundamental mechanism of dry eye disease, and again, there's a beautiful diagram in the, the TFOS DUES 2 report uh, that shows the sort of vicious circle of what actually is happening on a fundamental uh, level. Uh, but the key mechanism really is evaporation, which leads to hyperosmolarity, and that initiates this sort of vicious cycle of inflammation, symptoms, ocular surface damage, uh, which in itself perpetuates more hyperosmolarity and more inflammation, and it's sort of goes in circles and circles until it's disrupted and treated and homeostasis returned. Uh, and there are multiple entry points into this vicious circle. Uh, everything, everything from systemic medications to surgery to MGD to environmental conditions to autoimmune diseases and contact lenses and a million others that I'm certain I'm, I'm leaving out. But I would encourage everybody to take a look at it because it really does in a very beautiful graphical way sort of show what's going on on an inflammatory with the inflammation, with the osmolarity, with evaporation and all the various causes and it really again it helps to simplify you know what people see on a day-to-day -day basis in their offices. My Bowman gland dysfunction is the number one cause of that but um, all dry eye exists on this continuum Sure, there could be predomin a predominant subtype of aqueous deficiency, especially in patients with, say, Sjogren's syndrome, where the lacrimal gland is, is insulted and, and diseased and it doesn't produce enough tear. But interestingly, and this was in the TFOS dues too, that almost all dry eye, even purely aqueous deficient, if that is a thing, as it progresses and gets to later stages, will become evaporative too. So there is an evaporative component in almost all forms of dry eye. Atrogenic is a general term which means you, you know, uh, 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 problems that are created by medicine, by doctors, by, med by uh, our interventions which make things worse. And the iatrogenic thing is really, really important and I'm very happy that TFOS DUES 2 created a new subcommittee to look at this. This was not a section of the original TFOS DUES 1, uh, but over the ten, th that decade, again, so much new stuff has happened in the, in the decade since the original publication, that this was an important area that needed to be discussed, and uh, primarily for the reasons of improving patient care. Ultimately, all of this, you know, these two years of work and 150 people, it was all to help patients, you know, get the right treatment and to avoid creating new problems. And so the three big categories of iatrogenic dry eye disease would be one, systemic medications. So interestingly, and this was in the TFOS News 2, in 2009, of the 100 number one most prescribed systemic oral medications in the US, about 22, 23% of them had some direct tie into causing dry eye disease anti uh, you know, blood pressure medication, anti-allergy medication, uh, uh, GI ulcer medication, some antidepressants, uh, hormone replacements, things like that, you know, all can create uh, a form of dry eye or create dry eye or exacerbate existing dry eye. And so it's important as a practitioner and as a patient to be aware 
of what you're taking in on a day-to-day -day basis and whether or not that has a role in your dry eye disease. There are alternatives often for some of these things. Some are better than others. Um, and so for us, uh, when we're trying to help patients, we want to know what those things are and if we can affect uh, that in some meaningful way for the patient. The other second big category, and this is where we come in, ophthalmology, uh, are our topical drops. You know, topical drops notoriously have preservatives in them, a lot of them, uh, and BAK uh, is one of the big preservatives that has been used over the years. And one category in ophthalmology where patients have to use drops pretty much every day, sometimes three, four, five, six drops a day, is glaucoma. Glaucoma, to lower the eye pressure in glaucoma patients, often eye drops are the first line therapy and sometimes multiple eye drops. A lot of the glaucoma medications historically have had, had this BAK preservative in it, which we know, this is again evidence-based, it's, it's well known in, this, in the lab and in, real, in the real world, that BAK can, is, is very toxic in high doses and over a chronic amount of time to cause damage and, and, uh, to the ocular surface, to the epithelial cells, to the tear film. It damages the homeostasis, as it were, of the, of the ocular surface and leads to the symptoms and signs of dry eye disease. And identifying that is important. And then when you identify it, what do you do about it? Well, in the world of glaucoma, I think there have been major strides. And thanks to TFOS and the DUES-1 and certainly the DUES, TFOS DUES-2 to raising this awareness of these iatrogenic uh, issues, um, there have been major strides in the world of glaucoma uh, to A, take preservatives out of some of the drops. There are preservative-free varieties now. There are lower concentrations of BAK. There are other preservatives that are not as toxic. So much uh, uh, work has been done in that area. But also in the world of glaucoma, we now have uh, laser procedures that can be done to lower the pressure to sort of get people off some of those drops. And more importantly and more currently, uh, this new category of MIGS, this mi microinvasive uh, glaucoma surgery that can be done at the time of cataract surgery or independently of cataract surgery that can lower the eye pressure and again to take get people off of these potentially toxic eye drops. Uh, so again, identify the cause and then come up with a problem. TFOS DUES2 has raised the awareness and the world has followed with improvements in the way we deliver you know, glaucoma care. The other last big category in iatrogenic, and this was also, I think, very much unrecognized for a long time or not really given the, the uh, importance that it was due, and that is surgery. Um, all surgery that we do, whether it be anything from procedural things like Botox or eyelid blepharoplasties and things like that to intraocular surgery. In my area, I'm a cornea cataract refractive surgeon. I do cataract surgery, I do LASIK, I do laser vision correction. All of those surgeries will uh, cause probably a worsening of pre-existing dry eye or create, uh, at least temporarily, a dry eye situation postoperatively. Why is that so important in this day and age? You know, a little dry eye, you know, treat it, you know. No, the, the reason why is that patient expectations in the modern era, especially with refractive surgery, and that's cataract and laser vision correction, Patients expect perfection. There's a lot of out-of-pocket costs these days for premium IOLs, for limbal relaxing incisions, for femtosecond cataract surgery, for LASIK, PRK, SMILE, whatever it is. Patients expect perfection. And if you don't take into account the ocular surface before doing the surgery, you're gonna probably run into a lot of unhappy patients and a lot of problems. I like to think of it as a, a double whammy if you do not address this preoperative.